Hello, yes, it's working. Uh, sorry for this uh, technical problem. Uh, we are starting now the panel about uh, humanities and beyond. I would like to uh, thank you, um, Sophie Wenson, no? Uh, Brian Hall. There is no program, uh, Rowan Hadley. I'm sorry? Yeah, sorry, this is an old program. Uh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Rowan Hadley. Are you for the, are you uh, from the, this table? Yes, from Ubiquity Press, yeah. Uh, okay. Here of Brian. <laughs> okay, but w what's your name here? It, it's not on here. Okay. I'm so sorry. This is the, the previous uh, program. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, so I would like to thank you, uh, Iwan, Iwan Heidi, uh, Luke Boruta, and Dani Vanson. Uh, thank you so much for uh, composing this panel. Um, I am also representing João Costa from Global De Development Network. He couldn't be able to attend this conference, and I will uh, present his um, research. So uh, I would like to invite um, Sophie. Yeah? OK, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me? Great. Cool. Uh, while we wait for my slides, uh, just a bit of explanation for the confusion. <laughs> uh, yeah, this talk was originally supposed to be done by Brian from Ubiquity Press, with Sophie being the sort of backup speaker. Uh, neither of them could attend today, <laughs> so I'm the secondary backup speaker <laughs> for this talk. <laughs> um, oh, great. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, so good afternoon. I am here to talk to you about the Hermios project, um, specifically focusing on two work packages that are uh, related to metrics and alt metrics. Um, as I said, I am from Ubiquity Press. Um, I'm a software developer. My name is Rowan Hatherley. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ubiquity Press, um, this is basically just um, an overview of who we are. Uh, I'm not going to go into the, the full background of our organization. The important things are that uh, we are an open source publisher and open source publishing platform. Um, we like to say that we're um, research led. This is mostly working with our customers to um, find new ways to achieve our mission statement. And so this little guy over here is one of our customers steering <laughs> the ship that is our company. Um, all right, we like to show this um, diagram to our new customers, but um, it's actually quite nice for this conference as well. Um, it shows the benefits of um, publishing open access. Um, focusing more on this little middle bit here, uh, where we talk about you know, um, career recognition and collaborations, um, we talk about um, how um, citations um, so, well, open access uh, corresponds to high citations. Um, we don't really talk too much about altmetrics. Um, as we've heard early on today, citations tells you how well your articles are doing um, in a more academic-based um, environment, whereas altmetrics sort of tells you how you're engaging with um, the broader community, um, your impact beyond um, general academics. Um, one last thing, because uh, this is tying quite nicely, is uh, this is our customer charter. Um, we've got an editorial board who forces us to <laughs> maintain these principles. So um, everything we do is entirely open access. Our software, um, we strive to be open source, and we have this non-inclusive well, bundling. Um, what's quite nice about this is that um, the partners at Hermios sort of agreed with this um, approach. So everything we've done, um, we've tried to be as open as possible. All the software we've developed during this process is now open source. Um, and it's done in a very module, uh, modular fashion, which is quite nice. All right, so uh, just to uh, give a brief overview of Hermios. Um, yeah, Hermios was basically started by um, operas. I'm not going to go through the full anagram, um, the full 
abbreviation, um, of what Hermios was. Um, but basically, uh, it's a project that was designed to um, help integrate open access monographs um, into an open science ecosystem. Uh, this involved uh, developing new services to tackle challenges that are uh, faced in humanities and social sciences. Um, this also involves um, uh, providing data links and interactions with monographs um, to make way for new tools um, for research assessment. Um, and finally, just integrating these services into our different um, partner platforms. Um, uh, Okay, next slide is not happening. Hmm. Okay, um, I need to get on to my next slide, unfortunately. <laughs> um, it's being uncooperative. Uh, you the button? Uh, yes, yeah. I can't go back or forward. Uh, there we go. Great, okay, I'm back, thanks. <laughs> okay, so this is just a, a more of a diagrammatic um, overview of um, that process. Uh, so we've got the services we developed, um, they get integrated into our um, platforms to produce this data, which can be used elsewhere. Um, Hermios was um, undertaken by, I think, five or more um, publishing partners um, and spanned across seven different work packages. Um, of these work packages, two are relevant to this conference, and those are the two I'm going to talk about. Uh, the first is uh, was the fifth work package, um, the annotations work package. Uh, this basically involved um, integrating a service or integrating a you know, a tool called Hypothesis into our um, platform. Um, this allows um, users to create annotations on that platform. Um, or on books and you know, book chapters. Um, the nice thing about this is that when users use the annotation tool to interact with books, they are effectively creating um, things that can become alt metrics. <laughs> so um, yeah, part of the service is also collecting um, these annotations that users um, made on um, this hypothesis platform. Um, this sort of moved into the WP6 package, um, which was metrics and alt metrics. Um, so providing tools for um, publishers to um, measure their usage metrics, um, their other metrics such as citations, as well as um, alt metrics. So um, Twitter activity, um, Wikipedia activity, um, obviously um, hypothesis annotations and a few more. Um, yeah, for those of you who are not familiar with, I have done it again, I'm afraid. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm stuck again. <laughs> How did they explain the behavior? I'm assuming they might have done it. Cool. Um, well, while we're waiting for this, I can tell you the benefits of <laughs> annotations. Um, all right, so um, generally speaking, whenever you, um, not helpful, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, whenever you sort of, um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with um, Discuss. It's a, um, a little service that allows you uh, allows your users to um, kind of put comments at the bottom of I don't know an article or a blog post or something. Um, Hypothesis sort of takes this to another level. It allows you to highlight a section of text and make a comment specifically on that little piece of text. Um, so this allows um, well, it's used for multiple things potentially. Um, so users um, and authors can use it to enrich their content. Ha, awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, any of you who can speak French, um, yeah, this is from one of our partner presses, Stockholm University Press. Um, 
yeah, this is where Sophie's from. Um, yeah, so this is one of the books that has a lot of um, hypothesis, an hypothesis annotations on it. Someone's highlighted the section of text and explained, if I can remember correctly, um, that, that LOFT is a legal entity and the, what that means in terms of um, this book. Um, so it's a nice tool for um, enriching data by either providing um, additional explanation of terms. Um, you can link, um, obviously, sup well, link to supplementary data that is specific to a section of text. Um, authors have used it to update um, a bit of information. So they say this is the new research um, based on here. This is what um, we've come up with. Um, yeah, it can also um, be used in post-publication peer review. So a peer review that happens after it's gone to um, publication, which is quite nice. Um, and quite often authors use it just to generally engage with their readers. Um, so authors ask questions about their own content and um, the community kind of discusses things um, specifically in their books. Um, all right, so what does the um, metric system look like um, on an actual web page? Um, part of the work package, which I unfortunately forgot to mention, um, was um, this metrics widget that we've developed. Um, so this is um, one of our books um, called The Battle for Open. The reason it's here is because it also has a lot of hypothesis annotations on it. Um, unfortunately, showing a screenshot with the book and the actual metrics, because the metrics is a lot further down the page, so just pretend we scroll down and we got that. Um, all right. so. Basically, um, the way this metrics widget um, is structured is we show specifically um, how many different measures are available. So we don't have a donut saying um, this is a score, therefore this is a very good or very bad, well, not bad, but an less in engaged with um, article. Um, we just show how many measures we have available. So we're trying to be fairly neutral um, from that perspective. Um, in addition, we sort of have bundled our metrics and altmetrics um, together. So this book has um, a lot of downloads from OAPEN, um, but also 15 tweets. Um, it's been referenced twice on WordPress.com, once on Wikipedia, and has 12 hypothesis annotations. Um, something I have not shown here, and something that will be added um, soon. Well, it's already there. Um, the widget allows you to um, have an optional sort of additional information link. Um, this is where you would link to um, your usage metrics over time. Um, you know, the, it says 15 tweets there, showing specifically what those 15 tweets are, if people want to see what they are, see when those tweets were made. Um, yeah, hypothesis, again, shows you what those annotations are in the book, where they were made in the book, et cetera, links to that bit in the book. <laughs> um, yeah, and the last fairly interesting thing is this little question mark here. Um, we were talking about, um, I can't remember who said it earlier on, about um, you take on sort of trust what people have put um, in certain scores they develop. Um, in this little question mark section, it'll take you to um, a definition of that metric saying exactly how we calculated, how the data was um, aggregated, you know, did we consider retweets to be tweets um, for, um, yeah, well, Wikipedia is an interesting one, to be honest. Um, that one Wikipedia um, reference is actually composed of at least 10 Wikipedia pages. <laughs> um, Wikipedia releases new pages um, in future, so we've sort of um, removed the duplicates before providing that score. Um, yeah. Cool. So moving forward um, with this project, um, yeah, people often ask, um, is it Hermios, is it Hermeos, um, and things like that. Uh, I've been told this no longer matters. Uh, Hermios doesn't actually conceptually exist anymore. Um, it's a project that happened and no longer um, is running. Uh, Operas will run forward with the project, so they will effectively take ownership of it under Operas. Um, because they were the guys doing all the work. Um, and they will be the ones who will be um, expanding on this Hermios project. Um, as I said, all the code that has been produced is entirely open source. So um, yeah, you can go to um, that GitHub link. You can contribute to the code. You can download the code and use it for yourselves. 
Um, and again, it's um, under MIT license, which means you can develop it further for your own purposes with, I think, pretty much no limitations. Um, yeah, in terms of um, us being Ubiquity Press, <laughs> different hats, um, we're focusing on expanding, um, yeah, this isn't easily explained. Uh, we're expanding on the list of um, altmetrics we'll be collecting. Um, so the way the tool works basically is we've um, designed it to be modular. So um, we basically run a set of plugins. Each plugin um, collects a different metric or altmetric. Um, so the idea is to increase the set of plugins to collect additional information um, in future. Um, and yeah, as I said, um, this service effectively can be used by anyone. We are integrating it into our own um, sort of ecosystem, <laughs> as shown here. Um, so this is more or less um, a basic diagram of the different services um, we at Ubiquity Press um, have. So we've got repositories, conferences, in addition to journals and books, etc. Um, we've separated the metric system out as its own service, and we will be using it to collect metrics for each of those different um, services. <laughs> cool. And apologies for the little thing. That was a screenshot without realizing it. Cool. Uh, if you have any questions, um, please let me know. Thank you. Unfortunately, uh, João Costa could uh, be able to attend this conference due to some uh, health problems. Uh, so I am representing him. Uh, he sent me some notes and I will read him during the presentation. Uh, at the end of the presentation, there is a, uh, his email. If you want to contact him, please uh, do it. Um, Uh, the Global Development Network is a public international organization that supports high-quality, policy-oriented social science research in developing and transition countries to promote better li lives. It, support, it supports researchers with financial resources, global network, as a, well as access to information, training, peer review, and mentoring. Uh, GDN launched an innovative program to investigate the challenge of doing quality social science research in developing countries that we are here to present, in simply name, named Doing Research. Our guideline questions were established as we believed that the, by contributing to a better objective assessment of research system for social science in developing countries, it aims to expose weakness and shortcoming that can be addressed through better informed national research policy. Reproduction, uh, the production, diffusion, diffusion, and the use of locally grounded social science research is key to democratic debate and planning for sustainable development. Building on the current discourses on knowledge system, the program puts forward a full-fledged definition of what a research system is and operationalizes it to investigate the national environment for social science research in three main dimensions, context, actors, and systematic futures. The program proposing the doing research assessment, a three-step uh, method to study national social science research system through a context analysis, stakeholder mapping, and an indicator-based uh, theoretical framework. The program will produce both national and global reports. All data sets will be available in open access, and all outputs will be translated in accessible outreach material to support awareness and uh, action to social science research. The doing research pilot aimed to characterize characterize, describe, and uh, whatever possible, measure the most relevant fe features uh, of the research environment ac across 11 countries. It was implemented by GDN uh, between April 2014 and April 2016. 
with seven uh, research teams, teams in Africa, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Niger, uh, South Africa, Latin America, Bolivia, Paraguay, and Peru, and Asia in Bangladesh, uh, Cambodia, India, and Indonesia. Covering a diverse sample of countries in very different contexts and using varied uh, research methodologies, the pilot provides rich quantitative information of, on the complex nature of a research environment. Each team had their own report where the main challenge, key players, and how could they possibly address them on a long-term basis. The Doing Research pilot was generally supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Agence Francaise de Development, French Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Deve Development, and the Swiss Agent for Development and Cooperation. The pilot phase also highlighted the different strategic points we need to address in a scale-up phase. First, we must keep in mind that the final product must be flexible in order to take uh, into account the diversity of context and of research, research products. Second, the priority must be clear beyond developing a robust assessment tool before marketing. Developing a rank is a secondary consideration. Third, the final product must serve a diversity of stakeholders and propose policy actors to support the implementation of more efficient and uh, enable research policies, research administrations such as dean and rectors who take decision at the meso level, research themselves to document the challenges that apply to their research environment, and international donors and capacity building organizations to better tailor interventions and support. The implement, implementation of doing research assessment begins with an overall assessment of the context for doing research along economic, political, historical, and international dimension, dim dimensions, step one, followed by a mapping of national research actors to identify research producers and uh, users, uh, the contest assessment and mapping of national research actors, and then use as in, uh, input into the doing research assessment framework, using a combination of secondary data, surveys, and interview. Our analysis of the general contest in which research takes place is used uh, uh, made up of four, element, four elements, economic, historical, political, and international demands, dimensions. These are uh, assessed from a qualitative perspective to determine uh, the borders of our analysis, but most important, they allow us to develop a contextualized reading of the subsequent steps uh, of the DRI methods. During the cur current stage, uh, it becomes obvious that instead we should divide in it into three uh, spheres, economical, sociopolitical, and in international, as per the, the constant improvement from the interaction between GDN team, the national team, and scientific uh, adv advisor each one of them has. Document the contest to help develop an understand of uh, exogenous factors that impact the research si system, such as the cultural specificities, the, nat the nature of the political regime, uh, the level of human development of the access to technology. Since the pra practice of research is highly dependent of uh, these contextual characteristics, Documenting the context is critical for analyzing the indicators measured in step three of the assessment. The mapping is conducted to better identify the research actors, producers, uh, and users that make up the research system. It is directed at a macro-level analysis as the aim is not to assess each and every university or funding agency. Instead, we identify and characterize the importance of different groups of actors and the nature of relations between them and identify the main players within uh, each group. 
This allows a more contextualized reading of framework and eventually will enable research using the frame framework to tailor its uh, application to a particular type of actor. Research actors are divided into four categories, higher education, uh, institutions, uh, government and funding agencies, industry and civil level. These categories uh, have subgroups. Uh, for example, can be divided into public and private university, which can be for profit and non-profit organization, industry including for profit think tanks and consultancies, and civil society include NGO, open leaders, non-profit think tanks, and the media. Government and funding agencies is the most hybrid category. It includes national ministries and the research council, as well as public, private, foreign donors. Populating the framework is the final step in the implementation of ORI. It uh, describes the key determinants of each of the three main functions of a research system, namely the production, diffusion, uh, and policy uptake of the research. The framework follows a linear theory of change, which may well be a simplified version of reality, but it's nonetheless useful for documenting the factors that enable the production, diffusion, and policy uptake of social science research. It be, will be populated for each country by to documenting a list of indicators and aggregating those indicators in the multi-criteria composite uh, indicator. The three main functions of the research system are understood as per the following definitions. Uh, research production, research diffusion, and the research policy uh, uptake. The indicators which are a core of uh, doing research assessment is much connected into out metrics and we, n we know that this can contribute to ca captured diffusion and uptake that is not capture captured by science metrics. This is our current stage four uh, teams on the field about to finish their implement implementation, where they will present their results in Bonn in a couple of weeks. At the same conference, we will organize a side event where we are trying to cre create a global alliance to guide the research on research rational for, uh, rational for development. Why we are doing? Are, why are you doing all this? Because we can all together get all us, uh, get all these actors working together for the same goal while implementing their own agendas. We look for work, uh, forward to work with other organizations, agencies, or interest parties to support research, especially on the field of uh, outmetrics, as we truly think it is a, a vital for the development of our tool and overall program, uh, and we want to have as much input uh, as possible. Thank you and apologize for not being present, but I am more than available to reply by mail. Thank you. Thank you. I used to work for, for, for at Altmetric. Uh, I left last year, and since then I've been working more on policy, which is what I wanted to talk to you today about. So um, the background to this is I am working on a tool for policy. I'm not going to speak so much about the tool today. What I want to do instead is give you the kind of 10,000 feet view of uh, the kind of policy document landscape, if you like. And uh, I expect some of it's going to be common sense. And you'd be like, yes, why are you saying that? Um, uh, some of it's going to be new. I've got some data from, well, I've collected some data, and I've got some numbers coming out of that data. And some of it, hopefully, some of it you'll think I'm wrong. And that'll be useful, because then you can come and tell me why I'm wrong. And we'll both learn from that, hopefully. So let's starting at the sort of very top level. Um, 
talking of those early AM conferences, there used to be this really annoying question that would come up. Someone would inevitably say, but what are alt metrics? What do we mean by alt metrics when we say it? Or what counts as an alt metric and this kind of thing? And uh, it used to annoy me because, not because it wasn't a good question, because it is, uh, and it is an interesting conceptual thing, um, but because it would just end up in you know, three hours of slightly pointless debate. You know, debating, on, is this actually all metrics, or is it metrics more generally, yada, yada, yada. So it saddens me, saddens me a little bit to have to start with this, which is what are policy documents. You know, a few people this morning have mentioned about policy impact and policy documents, but everybody has a slightly different definition of what a policy document is. Now, it turns out even in the field, uh, in, in academia, when you're studying policy, there isn't necessarily a clear definition of what you mean by it. So uh, here's a straw man that I'm using, so a policy document. is a document specifically written for the purpose of changing policy or practice. It's a bit of a circular argument there. But it's not written, you know, it's not basic research. It's not aimed necessarily at other academics to, to further a field. It's aimed specifically at changing something, changing the way something is done. So if you take that as a starter, um, what does that imply or, or what can we figure out from that? Well, the first thing is, if you look at all the documents that fall under that umbrella, uh, you find they vary greatly in scope. So if we're talking about policy documents, there's international policy. If you think about climate, international climate change agreements or trade agreements, this kind of thing. And then nationally, obviously, you know, things that a uh, country's doing. But then, of course, at a state level, which is less important in some places than others. If you think about states in the US where you've got state universities, their mission is to contribute to the environment of the state, and that includes uh, state policy. And um, down to the city and even the street level, and you know, the parking bylaws in this small town. I actually don't know where Three Rivers is somewhere in the UK. They care a lot about something's happened to make them care about skateboarding, though. So, um, yeah, uh, so what I should add here is pragmatically, there's some decisions to be made. Because if you include all of this, and I've got some. You know more thoughts on this later, but uh, you know there's a lot of information here, and it's not necessarily relevant to policy alt metrics. So we have to make a kind of pragmatic decision about what's actually most interesting to users of our metrics. What can we get a handle on? Make kind of a you know how do we approach the problem? Realistically, here I think the answer is that people care more about the state level and above than very broadly than the city and street level. You're really kind of getting into the weeds once you're getting at that point. So they also vary widely in form. And this happens, I mean, this happens in scholarly publishing as well, right? Where if you have a letter in nature, a letter in nature is original research, right? It's peer-reviewed. It's not like a letter to the editor where you're complaining about skateboarding restrictions or whatever. Um, and equally, in the policy world, sometimes you'll see a blog post from a think tank that's actually the accumulation of you know, many months' worth of work. It's a well-researched piece. It's got references at the bottom. It's a report by any other name. Just because it's not in PDF form doesn't mean that you shouldn't treat it uh, the same as a policy brief from somewhere, somewhere else. So the reason for that is because it's, and it's simple when you think about it, is that they're designed to reach a particular audience, right? They, the point of this is to change policy, we decided. Like, you know, this document is to change the way something is done. And sometimes the best way to do that is by a blog post and not, you know, a 120-page PDF report. So you have to bear that in mind when designing systems to collect and process them. The culture is very different. And again, some of this, hopefully, you know, is, is common sense. But um, first of all, in terms of comparing it to the scholarly record, where we have much more of an emphasis on making sure that a document's permanent and you know, even if a publisher goes bust, there's still a, a, an an archive copy that libraries can access, but it's permanent. You know, once something's got a DOI, the ver that DOI points specifically to, to one version and not, you know, like five or six rewrites afterwards. None of that exists in the policy world. Um, it's rare to have a permanent record, so if a government department ceases to exist, it's not necessarily the case that someone's going to be archiving all that content. Um, often with a think tank, the document archive goes back to the last time their website was redesigned. Right. So they've got a fresh start from there, which is not necessarily something you want when you're looking at, you know, if you're a funder at a university and you're trying to look back 10, 15 years. Um, the citation culture is also very different. Uh, 
I, this, I don't have any evidence for this, but it looks more overtly political to me. I'd love to work with someone to figure this out, you know, figure out if this is true or not. Um, there's certainly more self-citation in policy documents uh, than in the scholarly uh, content. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, very interesting questions posed by these differences in citation culture. And um, if anyone is interested in doing this research, I'd, I'd love to work with you. But yeah, does open access status of a paper help it get cited in these policy documents? Can you detect political motivations in citations? Like uh, the big example uh, from a couple of years ago was after Trump got into power with all these documents going missing from government websites or being deleted from government websites, right? Uh, ones that mentioned uh, climate, man-made climate change, for example. So can you detect that in the citations in documents as well? So getting down to the numbers and the data, you know, what does this look like in terms of our metrics? Well, so another thing that's very different um, in policy document references compared to scholarly references is that they're made up of different types. So of the identifiable references in the tool that I've been working on, when you look at policy documents across the spectrum, so you know, this could be in it could be uh, clinical guidelines, it could be about science and technology, it could be about education, economics. Um, crime and punishment, this kind of thing. Across the whole spectrum, it works out to about a third of those references are to other policy documents. A third of them are to scholarly research, so things with a DOI uh, or a book. About a sixth of them are then to media outlets, which surprised me a lot. So I was saying before, there are more citations in policy documents to the New York Times, for example, than there are to the Lancet. Um, and then there's a sixth that are you know, to, to legislation and to patents and other things as well. When you're talking about tracking the impact of policy, and this is a broader our metric, certainly we talked about it at Almetric.com a lot, um, but it's especially true in policy, to kind of trace that path, the second order of citations are very important. So often what you'll see in policy is, I mentioned the New York Times being cited a lot. So you'll get research that's mentioned in a newspaper story and then it's the newspaper story that's cited as kind of evidence in the policy. Or you'll get research from a think tank that's a bit more academic and you know, it's done a bit more of a review or pulled in research uh, from the scholarly record. And then it's that think tank report that gets picked up and cited in the government piece or acted on uh, at a national level. So you really need not just the straight, you know, academic paper to policy document it equals impact thing. You need the, the kind of full citation network to get the fuller picture. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a bit hand wavy, and this might be where you disagree with me. I'd be interested in seeing what other people think. But um, it's hard enough to know how many scholarly articles exist in the world. Unless somebody has an answer now, I don't know. I think something like 180 million is the best estimate I've seen. Um, and that's in a field where you know, we have collection librarians and people as a whole you know, profession and a, a science behind it. Um, in policy documents, how many, you know, how many policy documents are there? How many should we be looking at to get a proper picture? Um, well, we can kind of make some guesstimates, try and get in the right order of magnitude. So if we think about, uh, first of all, governmental sources, you know, government departments, parliamentary bodies, so things like uh, here in the UK, uh, the parliament has a library and it briefs MPs. It goes off and it does academic research or it pulls in research from academics and then they synthesize it into these briefs and that's what MPs get uh, before you know, voting on the relevant topics. Uh, legal bodies, regulatory agencies, central banks, all these kind of things. We can very roughly say, okay, we've got 195 countries in the world. Let's say 20 of these places produce documents in significant numbers. Um, so obviously, you know, Tuvalu probably has less. Germany has far more, but let's assume it balances out. So that gives us about, about 4,000. Then in terms of non-governmental sources, where can we look? Think tanks are a big source. So there's, a, again, a wide variety of, a wide range of estimates here, but uh, the global go-to think tank index is the big kind of annual thing. This is what you see on think tank websites. They say, like, we're the number three most influential think tank in Southeast Asia working in economics, and this comes from this uh, think tank index report, and it says there's about three and a half thousand worldwide. Um, there's a little bit 
the, the data is a little bit dodgy in that when you go and you actually look at those stats and you look at the rankings, you follow them, you see like, you know, out of the three and a half thousand number, 300 on the list is this place in Albania that shut down 10 years ago and the website, you know, redirects to a domain parking thing. So you think, well, how can that still be, you know, in 2018, uh, this influential? But let's take three and a half thousand. And then add NGOs, IGOs, uh, foundations and private so contract research firms like RAND and, and MITRE and people who do work for the government. Um, and so you end up with somewhere in the region of 10,000 different policy sources. So that's a tractable problem, right, to track 10,000 different places. That's just the sources, not the documents. In terms of the actual documents, what you see is um, a long tail. So this is a list of different sources along the bottom and then how many documents they've got. So you can see that there's a bit of a concentration where there's a few sources uh, at the top here that have a lot of different policy documents uh, with references in them, and that's like the WHO. Uh, you, you definitely can't read it from where you are, but uh, it's like uh, the GovUK in the UK, like a lot of big aggregators, a lot of big IGOs. So a lot of sources have tens or hundreds of documents, not thousands necessarily. It's not like a journal. And you definitely can't focus on the big sources alone. You can't be like, well, do we get a good picture just by focusing on the top 500 policy sources? And that's because, uh, you know, obviously, context is very important. Uh, the whole kind of quality over quantity thing definitely applies here as well. If you think about the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that is obviously very, I, mean, I think that's a, a good place to have impact. It makes for quite a good story. But on the website, they only have 50 or 60 different reports, right? The output isn't necessarily uh, as great in policy document terms um, as a lot of other sources that might be less important for what's that worth. So for as a best estimate there, um, assuming we stick to those definitions about, you know, stay level and above, 10,000 sources, this kind of thing, I think there's about 3 million useful documents where we think if, if you had 3 million in a data set, you probably have a pretty good idea uh, or uh, could do a pretty good job of guessing where all these policy impact happens. And then in order of magnitude, more kind of filler documents. So for every document that does kind of cite its sources and things, there'll be you know, regulations or, uh, uh, or memos, committee notes, this kind of thing. And it's, it, it is important from a policy perspective, but not so much from an all metric tracking perspective. So collecting all this data is hard. It's hard collecting data from scholarly websites and it's much, much harder getting it from policy websites. So you routine, there's no good standard for metadata so you routinely find policy documents but on a website there'll be no date on them for example. So it seems like quite an important thing but the, not in any machine readable way. So there's no metadata in the PDF and there's no date listed on the website. And there's certainly no meta tags. This is a bit more of a technical complaint. There's certainly no meta tags uh, except maybe for social media. And often the policy is hosted by places with very low budget for IT or you know, there's obviously one person in the think tank who's responsible for updating the website. So it'll be on off the shelf sites like Wix or you know, handmade, hand rolled HTML and this kind of thing. It's not the case where it's, you can go to these places and there's an easy structured way to get documents to process. And that's so that's what I've been working on for the past year, trying to address some of these problems. Uh, and it's not anywhere close to 10,000 sources. Um, but it is enough of it, I think, to get quite a good picture and to get started on some of this research. And I'm going to end there. But having said that about Overton, those are the next steps. If you're interested, uh, especially if you have a research project in mind, if any of these questions have made you think, well, actually, that would be quite interesting to find out more about, please come and talk to me. I've got data for you. You can have it. Please do the research. Uh, or otherwise, yeah, come and chat in the break. Thank you. Um, so I'm one half of Thunken, uh, the other half Damien is sitting at the back. We're a tiny text mining, web mining company based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are obsessed with identifiers and URLs. Anything that is dirty, not canonical, non-standard, um, that's kind of what we're interested in. And um, we started working on citation tracking a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, the work that we do is uh, really a partnership with a nonprofit based in the US called the Free Law Project. And they have that project called Court Listener that gathers um, 
court opinions, legal opinions in the U.S. from all courts, local, state, federal, and a few special courts in the U.S. So we'd also like to thank Mike Leisner from the Free Law Project who helped us uh, make sense of the data because we're not lawyers, and uh, Casey who used to work at Thinkum. Uh, a few words about Cobalt Metrics because we're one of the um, smallest players in the field and newest projects. Um, we're interested in what we call web scale citation tracking. So metrics are a sampling game, nothing new here. Um, imbalanced data sets reinforce discrimination. At first I used to talk about like there's a bias in the data. Now I talk about discrimination, linguistic discrimination, you know, it gets people more interested. And to me, it is not up to citation aggregators, altmetrics data providers to define what is citable. So you, you cannot have an a priori filter on the type of identifier that needs to be used, the format, the language, publication venue, anything like that. We shouldn't be the ones doing that. And our role is to observe all citations patterns on the web. So to me, a citation from a document identified by a DOI to another document identified by a DOI is just as good as say, a uh, Twitter profile linking to a porn video, that's a citation, then you're never going to use it, but we need to collect it so you know you don't need it. Um, so with Cobol Metrics, we crawl the web to index hyperlinks and PIDs as first-class citations. Um, and then we have what we call the URI Transmutation API to, collect, to collate citations to all versions uh, of a document. So the API takes one URI, one PID, and returns all the URIs and the PIDs that we know identify the same document. Um, so in terms of sources, I'm only going to talk about one today. Uh, we do crawl everything from Wikipedia, Wikimedia, sorry, all projects, all languages. Uh, same thing with Stack, Ex Stack Exchange. We also uh, have started crawling data from Common Crawl, but today I'm going to talk about the stuff we do with US uh, legal opinions and the data that we get from Court Listener. So in terms of scope, we get all uh, US legal opinions from 400 different jurisdictions in the US. Uh, the data source is obviously Court Listener, so that project maintained by the Free Law Project. Uh, and in terms of citation extraction, Court Listener provides all the citations from legal to legal documents. And we're adding citations from legal to anything else, which is all URLs and PIDs mentioned in legal documents. We add that and we turn that into um, a searchable citation index. Um, so if you think citations in the scholarly world are complex, welcome to the legal world. This is only like part of the table of content for the Blue Book, which is the uniform system of citation for legal documents, um, which is a good reminder that uniform doesn't mean simple. So we have to handle all those cases, and most of the time, Court Listener takes care of those for us. So the citations in legal document are going to be old-style, text-only citations that are strongly formatted, though. So they turn those into URLs to Court Listener, and then we take everything else, and we make that machine readable. Uh, another challenge, and that's an example from a recent opinion from the U.S. Supreme Court, the layout of legal opinion is very narrow, so URLs tend to be split when the line breaks. So we've started to fix URLs. In some cases like those, it's, it's kind of obvious, you know, the, the tokens that you need to join. In some other examples, you don't really know if it's the last element of a slug, for example, at the end of the URL, or if it's just natural language. Um, so we've started working on that at some point when the system becomes good enough We will recontribute the data back to court listener uh, So that it becomes available for other projects that build upon the database and um, The last challenge which happens with every domain is link rot and content drift uh, So nothing lasts forever on the web and link rot in legal cita citations has been measured um, so more than 70% of URLs in the Harvard Law Review are now dead and more than 50% of URLs in the Supreme Court opinions are now dead too. So this is really bad. And one of the solutions, which is not different from many of the solutions we know in the scholarly world, is called PERMA, PERMA.cc. Um, it's kind of like the, the Wayback Machine and the archive projects. Um, and that's one of the things that we can use to still make sense of the data once it gets old. Um, I'm actually going super fast. Uh, and that's where I need some inspiration. So yeah, the API is uh, public, it is free, it is just capped at some point because our infrastructure cannot support you know, hundreds of thousands of queries. Um, yet. Um, yeah, nope. 
so in Court Listener, we have about 3 million citations uh, within, so from US legal opinions to anything else on the, on the web. Primary authority, and that includes opinions, statutes, rule, regulations, legislation, anything legal, accounts for 99% of citations. And then secondary authority accounts for 1% of the citations. So that's everything else. Citations to dictionary, short URLs that bring you to somewhere else on the web. Uh, product description that have been cited in a case or something. Uh, and 99% to 1% is exactly the kind of stuff we're interested in in Cobalt Metrics. We're interested in a long tail, in low frequency phenomena, the stuff that doesn't happen often. Um, that's the stuff we're interested in. And I had a very nice screenshot, but you can go on Cobalt Metrics yourself. Um, and for example, there are 26 DOIs um, or URLs whose host is doi.org cited in Court Listener, and um, we're going to continue working on that to um, make more sense of scientific data being cited in legal data. And all of this is part of Cobalt Metrics as part of our citation index. Um, I'm looking at those and advancing the other one. Um, a note on reproducibility. So in Cobalt Metrics, we aggregate many different data sources. So there are many moving parts. And we do love APIs, especially streaming APIs, but it becomes complex when you want to make sure that the data set that you use is reproducible. Because if you keep pulling, for example, from Court Listener that has an API, uh, you start comparing, I don't know, like opinions from California to opinions from uh, Iowa, for example. And at some point, we keep pulling data from Court Listener and the corpus changes. How do you know whether you can still compare uh, the numbers that you got? So what we do in Cobalt Metrics is that we ingest the entire data sets so that we control when and how the data gets updated. And with the API, you can get both a fingerprint of the whole database, so you know exactly whenever anything has changed, um, as well as the log of all the web resources that we remix, so Cobalt, um, Court Listener and everything else that we remix to make that work. Um, few words in conclusion about Cobalt Metrics in general. We're currently mostly closed source, but there are a few bits and pieces that have been open sourced. Uh, we have recently released the, an open roadmap for the next data sources, the next features, the next you know, endpoints in the API that we're going to release. And everything on the website is now CC BY. Uh, and most of the sources are, that we remix are either CC0 or CC BY. So you can reuse um, you know, the data that we produce kind of freely. And yeah, that's all I have. Question? Thank you. Sorry. Yes, please. Less of a question, more of a comment. Mm -hmm. There are DOIs for porn videos, mm -hmm. just worth noting. Um, in case anyone kind of turned up their nose at that example, <laughs> these are things which are registered, so that's just <laughs> worth saying. Um, and I think it's really important to focus on this kind of low level recording of linkages between mm -hmm. things. So I think this approach is great. Um, have you found an audience which is maybe more concerned with metrics, perhaps, um, open to ideas of talking about this kind of underlying linkage? Like, what's your kind of general response as you talk about this kind of thing? Um, most of the time, people who work primarily in English and on publications that are, or works that are privileged enough to be assigned DOIs don't really get the point. And uh, the feedback that I usually get when we talk about Cobalt Metrics and not only Court Listener is, OK, so we're missing maybe one person tops of the global production. So do we really need another project for that one person? Or could you know, Alt Metric come up with a new feature or cross of even data or something? Um, and my answer is that maybe it's only 1%. It's surely even less than that. But that 1% may account for 100% of my scientific production that is not picked up by, um, you know, solutions that focus on DOIs or sources that are mostly in English. Um, and so I think I don't want to have the same conversation about like everything, like, oh, preprints are fine, but what about data, software, et cetera? So it's really just a citation is a citation. A web resource that links to a web resource um, is enough for us to collect it. And then we need to collect everything for you to find what you want to find, because it's easier to filter out that to you know, add back. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. But so, yeah, to answer the question, where people who are interested in Cobalt Metrics are mostly people who work on languages other than English, uh, social sciences, humanities, like less privileged. 
um, you know, domains, fields, areas. And, and do you think the people who are part of the English communities do have the same problems, but they don't realize them? Or so I think, and maybe that uh, would be a better fit for the panel, but I think the domain has been very much saturated by a few players. And if that's the only data that you can get, uh, well, that's the only data that you can get, and it's good because that's the only thing that, you know, because it's hard to build a new infrastructure to collect citation by yourself. You're going to do that, you know, on the side. Um, so I think, yeah, we need to explain to people that, um, you know, it's fine that they cannot find everything about their data in other solution, and maybe by adding Cobalt metrics on top of everything, they'll find more uh, citation and, you know, traces of attention and impact. I'm so sorry, we are a bit late, but <laughs> I would like to invite you to ask uh, these questions to look sure. during the coffee break. <laughs> I'm so sorry, uh, and we return here uh, in 10 minutes. Thank you.